Well, good morning, everyone. We welcome you this morning and trust that uh, all is well in your household. And uh, we are praying for each one of you and, and asking God to, to intervene in this time of crisis. Uh, my name is Pastor Brian, and uh, we're speaking to you from the Gathering House in Chesterville. And with that in mind, we just want to let you know that if you do need help of any kind, we are available and, and ready to help wherever we can. Uh, if you need help, you can give us a call at our office at 613-448-1758. Or if you need encouragement or help as well, you can call me, Pastor Brian, at 613-498-5339. And we pray that uh, God will strengthen you and keep you close as a family and individuals to him during these times. Let's just begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you this day and uh, we know that you are with us. We know that you are providing the strength and the wisdom that we need, Lord, to live day by day in these times of this pandemic. And Father, we pray that your spirit would be at work in our hearts and our lives, Lord, encouraging us and giving us that hope that comes only from you lord that we would also gain your peace lord that passes all understanding and we must give our lives and our desires and our worries to you and so father we just pray your blessing upon this word this morning lord that as we look at your word that you would encourage us and uh, and see how you fit into this whole area of, of worry and anxiety and Lord, that uh, we may lean on you so that uh, our worries are minimal and uh, our anxieties are the same. So Father, just bless this word that we share together. In Jesus' name, amen. In a very specific way, Jesus specifically talked about worry and anxiety, and he made it a part of his Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 6, he says these words, beginning in verse 25, and I'm going to read the passage before we get into the word itself, into the message. And Jesus says in verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet our Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. One of the stories, okay, one of the stories that comes to mind when we're talking about worry is the story of Howard Hughes. And we're probably all familiar with the story of Howard Hughes. Hughes was a a big-time businessman who dabbled in oil, entertainment, and the aviation industry. And these pursuits made him billions of dollars. You would think that anyone with this type of money would be the picture of ease and tranquility. A person sitting by a pool, sipping drinks with little umbrellas sticking out of them. But nothing could have been farther from the truth with Howard Hughes. The last 25 years or so of his life, Howard Hughes was a poster boy for worry and anxiety. Overwhelmed by an unsubstantiated fear that people were out to get him, he spent his last decades living in hotels where he would rent out the whole floor. 
Those closest to him say he was so overwhelmed by worry and fear that he sat in a pitch black room for long stretches of time, refused to allow anyone to come in to see him. If you had to communicate with Mr. Hughes, specific instructions were provided. You had to take several tissues, cover the doorknob with them, knock and open the door ever so slightly. And Hughes required this process because he was exceptionally fearful of germs. His worry led to severe stomach problems, causing him to sit in the bathroom for hours at a time. In fact, one aide notes that Hughes once sat in the bathroom for 27 straight hours. On the rare occasion that Hughes would venture out of the hotel, he gave specific instructions to the driver. Only smooth roads were to be taken, and the driver was never to exceed 35 miles per hour, back in the days when we were using miles. On the chance they had to cross the railroad tracks or some uneven part of the road, the driver was to slow down to two miles per hour. Hughes was that nervous about getting in an accident. For a man who seemingly had it all, worry and anxiety dominated his life. And the overwhelming paradox of Hughes was that the more successful he got, the more worry and anxiety filled his soul. So as we talk about worry this morning, and as we talk about what Jesus thought about worry, we need to talk about the paradox of things and worry. And the paradox Hughes faced is the same paradox we face many times. Things do not eliminate worry and anxiety. In fact, they heighten worry and anxiety. And the biggest lies we tell ourselves usually begin with the two small words, what if, or if only. And if I could just get married, if I just had a car, if I could send my kids to a great school, if I just had that promotion, and there is no lasting happiness in these earthly possessions. Happiness this morning only comes from Jesus. And the context of this passage in Matthew where Jesus talks about worry is right on the heels of a passage in which he talks about seeking earthly treasures. So why does he follow up a lesson on materialism with a lesson on not worrying? Because Jesus understood that the more one has, the more there is a tendency to worry. Materialism, possessions breed worry. And when reflecting on his life before all the money and fame rolled in, automobile tycoon Henry Ford concluded, and I quote, I was happier when doing a mechanic's job. Multi-millionaire Andrew Carnegie once observed that millionaires never smile. And Solomon, a man who was known for wisdom and riches in the Old Testament, a man whom some regarded to be the richest in human history, had this to say in Ecclesiastes 2, verses 8 to 11. And Solomon said, I gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of men. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desire, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Understand and see this day things, earthly treasures, people, relationships, status, do not eliminate worry. They only serve to heighten it. And herein lies the great paradox of North Americans, 
we're regarded in the U.S. and Canada as nations that are rich in this world. Yet issues like worry and anxiety and depression are on the rise in both our countries. Consider these statistics, which are American to start with, but in proportion are true of Canada as well, I found. Stress and anxiety will significantly affect over 19 million Americans within a year. 33% of Americans will suffer job burnout in their lifetime. 70% of Americans will find themselves unhappy with their job because of stress. And 73% of Americans worry specifically over money. Even in my own life, I found that there were times when stress and work and the desire that I had within that caused me to step out of ministry as well for a while. And I was making a transition from predominantly youth ministry to thinking about doing something different and wanting to do something different. And it ended up taking me out of the ministry for a while. And a lot of us long for what we would call the much simpler days of our lives before all the worry and the anxiety took over. We had little to no worries or anxiety, and then life started piling on. Education, making and having enough money, marriage, raising a family, health and wellness, a big enough home, big enough car, and on and on and on. So the question becomes today, what divides your attention from heavenly things to earthly things? If you were discussing the question this morning, the biggest question would be, what are your biggest worries in life? What are the greatest sources of anxiety? And I think once we get to know what those things are in our lives, we can give them to God. We can give them to Jesus, who knows all about our worries, who knows all about our needs, and is willing to provide according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So there is a problem between things and worry about what we need, what we think we need, the paradox of things and worry hinder us all at times. So then he moves on to the problem of worry itself. What is the problem with worry? And because Jesus understands the worry is a universal human struggle, he is emphatic when he tells us not to worry. In the original language of the Bible, his statement against worry is written as a command. So why is Jesus so passionate about getting us not to worry? And I think this passage in Matthew chapter 6 gives us three reasons why worry is a problem. And in verses 25 and 26, first of all, we are told not to worry because worry can lead to selfish desires and decisions in life. It can lead to selfish decisions in life. And Jesus specifically tells us not to be anxious for our life because he knows that one of the major problems with worry is this. At the end of the day, and all of those worries, my worries, my anxieties, are all about me. All about me. My world, my desires, my longings. Worry is me-centered. And the worry that Jesus speaks of in this passage knows Nothing of self-sacrifice, nothing of laying down one's rights for the good of others, nothing of humility. He is talking about that outright worry that encases us in our own world. 
And this kind of me-centered living is evident in our lives in a variety of ways. Some of us think there is a certain kind of lifestyle we have to have which buys into the North American dream of happiness that is found in earthly treasures. Others listening think their worry is legit. And your worry may be a reasonable size worry, but have you prayed about it? For the most part, we, we worry without the prayer element. We're not seeking God in all of these things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Instead, we like to stay up late at night trying to figure out how to make things work on our own. And we lose that valuable sleep, and we lose that time through this worry. And you worry, and many of us get into this at in times, in certain lengths of time, because of our refusal to trust God, which is just as me-centered as other situations of worry. We often stand before a God and feel confident in being able to cover all these situations, all these worries, on our own. And we don't have to do that. Even in the situations that we find ourselves in our world these days, it would be so easy to hide away in a closet, to totally absorb in the things of the culture, and our pandemic that we face, and yet God is there, and we can go to God, and we can find that freedom from worry to the degree that we can live our lives and trust in Him. So the first problem with worry is it leads to selfish decisions and directions in life. But secondly, Jesus alludes to a greater problem with worry in verse 27, which, again, a very black and white statement from Jesus is that worry is useless. Worry is useless. And he brings his point home when he says that worry doesn't add a single hour to a person's life. Listen to these statistics on worry. I found them kind of fascinating. 40% of what we worry about never comes to pass. 30% of what we worry about happened in the past and can't be changed. 10% of what we worry about relates to health, which is kind of an ironic statement in, in that researchers have proven that worry actually makes your health worse, not better. 8% of worry is legitimate, but even then, my worrying about it, your worrying, won't change it. So your worry accomplishes nothing in Jesus' mind. Your worry does not make that loan go through. Your worry will not make you pregnant or unpregnant. Your worry will not get rid of the cancer or keep us from contracting COVID-19. Your worry will not pay the bills. And Jesus is telling us all point blank that our worry is useless. So worry leads to selfish decisions. Worry is useless. And then thirdly, the final problem with worry is that it is worldly because it is symptomatic of how unbelievers act in verse 32. And Jesus is saying to us all that the lives of those who couldn't care less about him are dominated by earthly treasure and therefore worry. And when you and I as believers worry about our jobs, our health, our money, our mortgage loans, our kids' schools, our cars, and our clothes, we're acting like the world. And to be dominated by worry is essentially to show that our ultimate hope is not 
in a loving, caring Heavenly Father. But in the things of this world. And he needs us to understand that one of the best ways we demonstrate the gospel to the world is when we don't worry. So one of the things that I encourage us all to do today is to make up our mind this moment, this day, to glorify Christ by making the decision not to worry. Let's put it in his hands. Let's trust him for all of these things that are coming our way, whether they're from the pandemic or not, whether they're personal issues, whether they're related to the health issues that we face day by day. God is there, and Jesus is walking beside us. So in this passage, how do we overcome worry? And that's the final thing that, that Jesus talks about in this passage, is now that we've talked about worry, how we've brought up all of the problems and the reasons why worry is bad or wrong, even though we all worry to a degree, we need to figure out how to overcome worry, especially as we, we trust in Christ. So how can we overcome worry in our lives? In verses 26 to 30 of Matthew 6, Jesus employs a particular kind of argument called a fortiori. A fortiori. And it's a kind of argument that moves from the lesser to the greater in its reasoning. And Jesus begins the lesser when he says that our Heavenly Father takes care of the birds and the grass. Then he moves to the greater when he says, our Heavenly Father takes care of us. And his point is quite clear. Do not worry, because if God takes care of the lesser creatures, like birds or smaller parts of creation, like a flower, how much more is he going to take care of the ones he made in his image? You and me. We are created in God's image. And he's not willing that any of us should perish without a relationship with him. He holds us that highly in regard. And so he's going to take care of his creation. But notice how Jesus refers to God through the text. He refers to God as our Heavenly Father. And this image casts us as God's children. We are children of God. We are children prone to worry because they assume their parents will take care of them. We are prone not to worry because our parents do look after us. So no child that I know of thinks, how is the mortgage going to get paid today? And they give no thought to whether or not they are going to eat or how their athletic fees are going to be paid. All of that gets covered. A warm home, three meals a day, clothing, transportation, love and care, and a family environment all happen for children whether they realize it or not. They reap the benefits of it. They reap the peace of it. And it's our duty as parents, as fathers and mothers, to create an atmosphere where my child, your child, doesn't have to worry. That's what God wants to do. He wants to create a relationship with us that we don't worry in excess. Because Jesus says, your Heavenly Father knows your needs. Let me ask you this morning, do you think the layoff at work was a surprise to him? No, he knows your needs. Do you think this health scare that we are experiencing in the present caught him off guard? No, it didn't. 
He knows our needs. And all of the related issues to this pandemic are not surprises to a God who knows the beginning from the end. He knows our needs. He knows what we need. He is right there with us day by day. And so we need to trust him, to put our faith in him, and relax that he knows how all this will work through. He will know the beginning from the end. So as we close this conversation about worry, how do we not worry? How do we trust God to see us through these hard times? Well, if you're a believer and you have a relationship with God, we need to think of a time in our past when we didn't think we were going to make it, whatever that it might be. And think about those times when God showed up, or when God provided for our needs, or when God walked us through those troubled times and got us through the other end. We need to use these stories to see us through the present. Because if God was faithful 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, or 5 years ago, He still is faithful today. And He still promises to walk with us, to guide us, and to provide for us. Think of a time when you didn't know how things were going to get paid. Yet, in His way, God stepped in and paid it, and got it covered. Think of a time when you didn't think you'd live to see another day, yet God touched your body, and you're alive today. Think of a time when the stress was so great that you thought you'd lose your mind or your marriage, yet God stepped in, and here you are today. And oftentimes in our own humanity, when we got to the other end of those struggles, we often ask ourselves, why did I worry so much? Why did I waste all that energy being so worried? God says, relax, I'm here, I've got you. Worry can create spiritual amnesia. And I think we need to remember that. Worry can create spiritual amnesia, causing us to forget the God who saw us through all of those circumstances. It's called a faith journey for reasons, because we need to look back at all of those experiences where God was faithful and God provided and God cared. And we can look back and see those things and say, since God was there then, I know he will be there now. So let us put worry on the shelf and let us trust God. We need to remember the stories of his faithfulness and reflect upon the testimony he's established in our past to see us through this present. We need to trust Him so that this present doesn't become overwhelming. Where this present doesn't lead us to make wrong life decisions or directions. We need to trust God so that this worry doesn't become a useless waste of energy. We can be concerned. We can be discerning. We can be diligent in what we're asked to do. And then when we've done that, regardless of whether we're talking about a pandemic or a financial situation or a family situation, when we've done the basics that we need to do, we can trust God and we can rest in peace and save our energy for other things. As we close this word today. 
Let me read a very familiar passage of scripture, which is probably going to be read many, many times over the next few weeks. And in the letter of Philippians, Paul is telling a, a young church these words found in chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. And Paul says to all of us, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Please be assured that you are being prayed for, that there are people who are keeping you on their prayer list, and as a church we uphold our people and anyone who desires to know Christ, to know needs are being met. And again, we give you those numbers that we gave to you at the first. If you do need help, you can call our church at 613-448-1758, or you can give me a call if you need encouragement or prayer or need at 613-498-5339. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you are more than sufficient for all of our needs. Father, we thank you that you are overseeing all of these issues that we face. Lord, that you know this pandemic before it even arrived here. Lord, that you know our needs before we even speak them. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us a spirit of rest, that you would give us a spirit of peace, Lord, that hands all of these things over to you and trust you to provide our every need, to give us that peace that passes all understanding, to take away the worry and the anxiety, Lord, that we can function with those around us and continue those relationships in an encouraging way. And Father, we pray that you would use your people who know you by name to bring that hope and that encouragement to the world and the communities around us so that you may receive the honor and glory that is so due. And we give you praise from our own lives, from our own experiences of faith, and knowing that you will be faithful to the very end. And we give you praise in Jesus' name with much, much thanksgiving. Amen.